computer on me, but uh, this is uh, where we're going to. So I'll, I'll just read this chapter again, and I think it's good to remind ourselves, as I, as I often say, you know, repetition is a good teacher. So chapter 20 of Exodus, God spoke all, all these words. That's, that's important even to remember that, that God himself spoke all, all of these words. This is to Moses. Uh, in fact, God not only spoke them, but he wrote them. And he wrote them on his own finger, on a tablet of stone, or two tablets of stone. Um, we don't know, I suppose nobody knows um, whether there was five on each stone, or there was four in one, six in the other. We haven't a clue. Um, but uh, anyway, God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, that's the first commandment. We've looked at that already. And then secondly, you shall not make for yourself an idol in any form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse... <coughs> The name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor daughter, nor your manservant, nor maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For six days, in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbour, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, nor his manservant, or maidservant, or his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. And when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we'll die. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of the God will be with you to keep you from sinning. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. And then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside me, and do not make yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. Make an altar of earth for me, and sacrifice it uh, on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Whenever I cause my name to be honoured, uh, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones for me, but don't build it with dress stones, you, for you will defile it uh, if you use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps, lest your, your nakedness be exposed on it. And we'll just end the reading there. Um, just by way of, of uh, introduction, <coughs> um, it probably doesn't need to be said, but uh, the Ten Commandments are not arbitrary. Meaning, you know, you can either take them or leave them. Um, and they're not temporary, just given at a certain time for a short time. They don't need to be revised. Um, and whether we like it or not, we, we, we if we disregard them um, and, and disregard following the Ten Commandments in our own lives, in our own hearts, we do so at our own risk because God takes us very seriously. Um, they're not just something from the you know, from a distant past in the Old Testament, uh, this isn't just a, you know, as we gather around these Ten Commandments uh, over the next few weeks and the past couple of weeks, uh, this isn't just a, an interesting Bible study uh, or a history lesson uh, um, or something that's got no relevance to us. In fact, it, it, it has every relevance to us. Um, and in fact, the first two commandments, we've already looked at the first one, are very closely related. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not 
bow down to them or worship them. But while they're, they're similar and they're related in a similar sort of way, uh, um, you know, they're related in that they, they both have to do with the worship of God, but um, there's an important difference. The first commandment forbids worshipping a false god. Right? You agree? That, that's what mm. the first commandment says. The second commandment forbids worshipping the true God in a false manner. The first commandment has to do with who we worship, but the second commandment has to do with how we worship. And the first commandment forbids worshipping the false gods and idols of other nations. And the second commandment uh, forbids the use of idols in worshipping the one true God. Now, we'll try and explain all that as we go in the next, uh, the next wee while. Um, the main thrust uh, of the first commandment is that since the, since the Lord is who he is, since God is who he is, and since God has done what he's done, um, he's not going to share his worship and his praise, and, and he's not going to share his glory with anyone else or anything else. Uh, he alone deserves all the praise and the glory and the honour and the exaltation. Uh, and so he calls us, he calls us people then, and he calls us still through these commandments, he calls us to absolute loyalty to him. Uh, and loyalty, you know, is a word that's sort of gone out of out of people's hearts and minds in many ways in these days. People aren't as loyal to things as they used to be, and I'm not talking about the loyal orders or things like that. Um, but just commitment, you know, loyalty, commitment. Um, and uh, but God calls us to that, to absolute loyalty to Him and to Him alone, uh, and to worship Him uh, in all of our all aspects of our lives um, with complete complete devotion um, it's been said and it, I think it's, it's, it's true that everybody is going to worship something <coughs> because as we are in our nature uh, we're religious with a small r uh, uh, and, but the truth is that we will become like what we worship. Um, and when we worship idols or false gods, we'll become like them. In fact, the psalmist says it very, very clearly. Psalm 115, you've got some of these references in the notes, but Psalm 115, verses 4 to 8, the psalmist says, But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have noses, but they can't smell. They have hands, but they can't feel. They have feet, but they can't walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty, uh, Psalm 15. Psalm 115. One hundred and fifteen verses four through eight, uh, and and you know the the opposite is true that when we worship God and Christ as we ought, and our devotion and loyalty is to Him, we will become more godly. We will become more Christ-like uh, for that. John four twenty four of course says that God is spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth and so no material thing no physical thing can describe God uh, and Isaiah says that very clearly in Isaiah 40 verse 25 to whom will you liken me says the Lord or to whom shall I be equal says the Holy One uh, it just can't happen but this second commandment all the commandments as I've said uh, are timely and, and relevant for us today because I think to a large degree, and you may disagree with this, but to a large degree, 
idolatry is the challenge of true religion and has been through the ages. Idolatry uh, has always been a challenge <coughs> to true religion. Um, there's a little bit of an aside, it just comes to my mind, but I don't know if you've uh, watched or knew anything about the Eurovision Song Contest, mm -hmm. but Ireland's entry mm -hmm. is absolutely <laughs> crazy. She's actually a witch, I looked her up. I mean, she's an actual witch involved in, in paganism, blood sacrifices, and all sorts of stuff. And, uh, <coughs> and yeah, what a good reception too, I think. Oh, well that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. The world's just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, say, I don't know what say, but the world's coped. It's coped. Mm -hmm. uh, crazy altogether. Uh, long ago gone are the days of Dana, and uh, all things. Uh, remind me of you. The song anymore is because the performance. Oh, it's the whole performance. It is. It is. And, and Britain's entry is no better. He's a. He's a. Oh, desperate. Um, but anyway, idolatry. Um, I think we all face the temptation, um, sometimes to to adjust our thinking about God. To sometimes accommodate our own ideas about who God is and our own partialities, our own preferences and, and to remake God in our own image and in our time in our days uh, in our culture these days everything has more to do with the eye gate than the ear gate um, in, in other words it was a time when you um, hearing and listening and all of that was more important but now it's all to do with visual. Um, and uh, for many Christians, sadly, it's easier to walk by sight than it is to walk by faith. Um, and, and to make the visual rather than the verbal our priority. And I'll, I'll explain that uh, as we go here. Um, because if you think about it, that's what happened the way back in the Garden of Eden. Um, when our first parents fell into sin. Eve, the woman, saw that the tree was good for food. And, uh, and that it was, as Genesis 3 and 6 says, a delight to the eyes. Uh, and to be desired for making one wise. So she took of the fruit of the tree and she ate. She gave priority to the visual over the verbal that God had just spoken. Right? Uh, she stopped listening to what the Word of God said uh, and filled her eyes uh, with an image instead. And uh, of course, the images, any images that we choose, can never really match the reality. You know, images. Um, you take a photo of, of, of a beautiful sunset, and there's been some, and I hope there'll be more. Um, you take a photograph, an image of it, it's useful to, 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 to recall the memory of it, but it doesn't come close to the majesty and the splendor of the real thing. And the same could be said, for example, of a, a widow or a widower's photograph. Um, of their long gone spouse that sits on the mantelpiece. It may be very precious to that person, but it's a poor substitute for that spouse in reality. Um, and while people can make images of anything, however beautiful they might be and all the rest of it, they'll always the image will always fall short of the reality. And that's the problem with uh, when we come to, you know, sometimes our own self-imagined ideas of who God is and our ideas about God um, uh, and so on. Because we have finite minds um, and it will always fall short of, of, of the real thing. In fact, it will dis usually distort the truth about God time and time again if we try to imagine and think um, 
about who God is and what God's like. In another time, in another era, uh, the Reformers, those great men of God who brought about the Reformation, they used to talk about a thing called a liturgy of silence. A liturgy of silence. Not a practice of seeing or doing or even speaking, but the practice of listening. And I don't know much about the Quakers, but I think the Quakers are still a bit like that. They would have a liturgy of silence. Um, and we could do it more, more than that probably these days because our world is just full of noise. Absolutely full of noise. Um, but what they meant by a liturgy of, of, of listening was that our, our, our worship, our biblical worship and biblical devotion to God is to be focused on God's word to us. <coughs> His word to us. Scriptures. Um, <coughs> we have no, no images or icons or statues or crucifixes uh, because they really serve no place. They, they don't fill any function in a biblically ordered Christian um, worship or, or devotion to God. Um, and God has ordained that. Uh, and the Bible, the revealed word of God, the, the God's revelation of himself, draws us to himself. Um, God communicates himself to us by means of his word. Um, and, and so you could say that really for the Christian, ours should also be a liturgy of listening. He speaks through his word. We listen. We listen to a still small voice. And sometimes it's a loud voice. But we listen to hear him. Uh, there's an old song that says, He speaks, and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful, broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Um, that's the scripture of position. God speaks, we listen, and then we have a choice to make. Do we follow through? Do we obey? Do we um, not? And so on. But the clear and immediate meaning of this second commandment is that God is to be worshipped without any visual symbols of him or representations of him. Because, as, as I've said in John 4 and 24, God is spirit. He's infinite and he's you know, so great we can't even describe him. Um, and no physical representation could ever do justice to who he is and to his glory and to his majesty. Um, and the problem with statues and shrines and pictures is not that they don't look good because there's plenty of good looking, you know, ornamental things and pictures and so on. Um, but the, the problem is that no matter how good they might look, they will inevitably blur the truth about God's nature and his character. So images tend to distract us um, from worshipping the true living God and instead lead people to worship whatever representation is before them. That's the temptation. Talk about that again in a minute. Um, but more importantly, the second commandment takes us beyond mere idols and images and, and idol making. It actually takes us into our own thought life. Our hands might be innocent from making any graven images, carving out some, uh, some idols, but our imaginations seldom are. And any conception thought of God in our minds and hearts that's not derived from his word, from the scriptures, corrupts this commandment. Um, now, when God gave instructions for the building of the temple, uh, he ordered that the Ark of the Covenant, on which his presence would dwell, would, would stay in the most holy place. But the Ark contained no visible representation of God. Instead, there were the two tablets of stone, Ten Commandments, uh, and it was as if God was saying, don't look for me in any shrines or any paintings or any statues. Look for me in my word. 
So if we take our cues from God and if we want to properly worship him uh, and if we want to meet with him and to know what he's like, we have to conform our minds to his word. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He, he's, he's published his truth and about who he is for us to read about and to, to understand and to get a grasp of. And, and so we're to sort of tether ourselves to what he has already revealed. Because our own attempts to conceive of God, apart from his own revelation, will fail. Will fail. Uh, so what's at stake in this second commandment is the integrity, not only of our worship, but also our lives, our living, uh, as we live our lives before him. Because when people go wrong, listen, when people go wrong in their worship, in their understanding of what it means to worship God, invariably they'll end up wrong in their living. Um, I'm seeing that more and more uh, as a pastor. And I'm seeing it across the spectrum of God's, God's church around the world. People who build up these churches doing all sorts of crazy things, not worshipping him the way that he wants to be worshipped, and think it's great and creative and all the rest of it, and then all of a sudden, it all collapses. And you find out that behind it all, some of these leaders have been doing things they shouldn't have been doing. And so, um, that's, what, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. When people go wrong in their worship, they tend to end up wrong in their living. And any, anything or anyone that would encourage us to worship God um, incorrectly not according to his word will, will prove to be harmful to our own spiritual growth we've got to be discerning about that and uh, you know it's a tragedy to embrace an image an idea of who God is even if it's an, uh, an idol uh, and miss out on worshipping the real God uh, or to sit at a shrine and, and miss out on worshipping the saviour it's a choice today when that happens. Now interestingly, I think I mentioned this and some of you probably know this, the second commandment that we're looking at tonight is completely missing from the catechisms that are taught by the Catholic Church, especially the children. You can look it up and see that that's true. The Roman Catholic Church has removed the second commandment, uh, but they've split the tenth commandment because even the Roman Catholic Church knows that there has to be ten commandments. So it's interesting that they've taken out this second commandment about worshipping at idols and graven images and all the rest of it. Um, now, I, I've no doubt uh, if you were to talk to a priest or to some Catholic theologian that have their reasons for that, but it's a dangerous thing when you take something out of the Word of God. A very dangerous thing. Well, there's two things sp specifically prohibited forbidden in this second commandment first found in verse 4 you shall not make for yourself an idol in any form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below in other words you shall not make idols you shall not make a, any material physical object used to represent God for the purposes of worship it's wrong to make an image of anything for worship in fact the whole universe of potential uh, idols or objects of worship is covered in this verse. Firstly, you shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above. And the word heaven has several meanings in the scriptures. Sometimes it refers to the heavenly or spiritual realm. And that would, that would mean that we're not to make images of the angels or demons or imaginary gods for the purpose of worship. And then in Revelation chapter 22, John says, I, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing these things to me. But he said to me, don't do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and prophets and all who have kept the words of this book. Worship God only. So even John was reprimanded for falling down the foot of an angel. And the angel reminded him to worship God only. Revelation 22. And then secondly, heaven above can also refer to the heavenly bodies. And so that would prohibit someone from making an idol in the form of the sun or the moon or the stars and all of that. Um, and yet, how common it is, even for some Christians, 
And I'm going to use the word worship loosely here, but go to the daily newspaper and look at their stars. Right? Um, of course, heavens can also refer to the sky, which would, again, prohibit making an idol in the form of any of the creatures of the air, such as birds or, or flying insects or anything else. And then thirdly, it says, uh, on the earth beneath. And that would prohibit making idols in the form of land animals, such as cows, uh, as they do in India, or elephants, or even man himself. And in, in, in the waters below, it says as well, that would prohibit making idols in the form of the creatures that live in the waters, such as fish, or crocodiles, or sea animals. And yet there are people who, who do that. Who do that. In other words, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything at all in either the material or the spiritual realms. Um, but it sort of begs the question, what's wrong? What's wrong with making an image of God to worship? What's wrong with doing that? It's not the true God. Well, it can never be a true no. representation of who God is. You're right, Tony. It has to do with making up your own thoughts about God because idolatry will always start somewhere in the mind. Somewhere in the mind. And the word image is related to the word imagination. And so how can we possibly imagine God adequately? We can't. We, our minds can't contain who God is and, and what God is like. And when we make an idol to represent God uh, Really what we're doing is trying to bring God down to our level. Uh, and, and again, remember that sin was introduced into the world with the temptation, you shall be like God. That's what Satan said to Eve, you shall be like God. So it's been around a long time. God created man in his image. So when we make an idol, we're attempting to create God in our image and according to our own ideas. And, and that's not on as far as God's concerned. Idolatry is wrong because it, gives, it will always give a distorted image of God. We must worship God, as I keep saying, as, as he's revealed himself to us in his word and not, not according to our own um, imaginations. Um, you know, you sometimes hear people say these words. You know, this is how I like to think about God. And we should realise if we, if we say that, we're treading on dangerous ground because our minds can take us in all sorts of directions that maybe aren't biblical. It doesn't really matter how you or I like to think about God. What matters is who God has revealed himself actually to be through his word. So the first thing prohibited by this commandment is the making of idols out of material things or in your own mind. And the second prohibition, forbidden thing, is to be found at the beginning of verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. That means don't, don't worship your own image of God or, and don't worship anybody else's image of God. And there's at least three, three reasons, obvious reasons, why you shouldn't worship an image of God. Firstly, it's impossible. We can say on that. We can't represent God accurately by an image. Uh, as I said, Isaiah 40 declares that God says, to whom will you compare me or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. So it's impossible. And that's the first reason. The second reason is it's absurd. It's totally ridiculous to worship an image of God. Um, now listen, I want you to turn... Um, I'll take a break from my voice to Isaiah chapter 44 you probably know you probably know these verses Isaiah chapter 44 um, we're going to read uh, beginning at verse 13 Isaiah 40, 44 verse 13 13 through 17. Would someone like to begin reading there? <coughs> the carpenter measures with a lane and makes an outline with marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. 
he shapes it in the form of man, a ma of man in all his glory, that it may dwell in his shrine. He cuts down cedars, or perhaps takes a cypress or oak. He lets it grow among the trees of the forest, or planted a pine, and the maiden in grow. It is man's fuel for burning some of it. He takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Verses 16 and 17. Yeah. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I see the fire. From the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my God. You get the picture there that, that Isaiah is trying to put together. And, and, and the next few verses is really his, his uh, evaluation of, of that whole, you know, that whole thing. Um, verses 18 through 21. They know nothing and they're un they, they understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they can't see and their minds slow so they can't understand. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, Half of it I used for fuel, I even baked bread over its coals and roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what's left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? He feeds on ashes, a deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, Is not this thing in my right hand a lie? Remember these things, O Jacob, for you are my servant, O Israel. I have made you, you are my servant, O Israel, and I will not forget you. It's, it's incredible, you know, that, that they would do that. They would take wood and use it to heat, you know, heat, them, heat the, by the fire of wood and over the fire cook food and use it for fuel. And, but then they'd take the same bit of wood or another bit of the same wood and turn it into an idol. Like, how ridiculous is that? Um, and that's what Isaiah is trying to point out. And then the third thing about why we shouldn't do that, it's impossible, it's ridiculous. The most obvious thing is it's actually unlawful. It breaks God's law to worship an image of God. And in Deuteronomy, in a parallel passage to what we've read, we also read this. Uh, it says, So watch yourselves carefully since you did not see any form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire, so that you do not act corruptly and make a graven image for yourself in the form of any figure. Um, th this second commandment is a command for us to not only abstain from making pictures uh, of false gods or visual representations of, 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 of God himself or false gods, but it's also a command that we don't, uh, don't visually represent the true God. Don't, just don't do it. And God has forbidden it. So what part of no don't you understand, basically? Um, and then the point's made again, it's made very clear in Exodus 32. You're probably familiar with the, the story, the aftermath, if you like, of the golden calf. Um, the first, maybe the first few times that you read about that, it's easy to think that the golden calf was the image of a foreign god that was being introduced into the worship of Israel, maybe from Egypt, where they just come out of. But if you look at verse 4 of chapter 32, you see that Aaron, when, when Aaron made this golden calf, you remember, they, they got fed up waiting on Moses to come down from the mountain. And, uh, but verse 4 tells us that when Aaron made that, that was Moses' brother, um, when he made that golden calf, he made the golden calf as an image of God, the God of Israel who had brought Israel out of Egypt. In other words, he wasn't saying, you know, he wasn't saying by making this, this image, you know, children of Israel, the God of Israel has got us this far, but with Moses in the mountain, we don't know where he is when he's going to come back, so we're going to go to another God now. No, he wasn't saying that. The golden calf was an image of the God who had brought them out of Egypt. Uh, you read that, that passage in Exodus 32, it makes it clear. And Aaron wasn't attempting, he wasn't attempting to hijack uh, the religion and take them into another form of religion. He was attempting to visually represent God himself. And he shouldn't have done that. Um, 
there are two ways to commit idolatry. You can worship something other than the one true God, or you can worship the one true God by some other means that he has not appointed or approved of. And, uh, you know, I think, as I've said already, there's a tendency today to seek to worship and serve the God we want, not the God who is. And, and you know, I've said it already, we, we live in a, a video, visually dominated, image dominated culture. <clears throat> and that's... <laughs> That's again what your vision is all about. It's all about image and all about visual. It's no, no longer about the songs and the singing and the singers. Um, but we live in that sort of moment in time, I suppose. And God said, when you think about me, you have to think about me in accordance with my word. Images, visuals distort me. Uh, representations distort me. Your imaginations distort me. So if you want to know me, you have to know me simply through my word. And, uh, you know, because of God's self-disclosure of himself, his self-revelation of himself, you know, through Moses, through the words of the prophets, and so on, um, he, 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 he revealed, he has revealed himself um, to dominate our understanding of him by his own revelation of himself not by our experiences and there's so many Christians these days that are running after experiences not our imaginations, not our opinions or anything else in other words God's word the scriptures are to be the source of our notions if you like, our ideas of who God is um, because, you know, if you, can, if you can think about God any way that you want to think about him in accordance with our own imaginations, then we're sovereign over God. And, and if the God of heaven is only as strong and unchangeable as our opinion, then he's in trouble and I'm in trouble. I read the story of a, of a businessman who discovered alarming cracks on the wall of the 43rd floor of his office building. And so, right thing to do, he called in a structural engineer who came and looked at the cracks on the 43rd floor. And immediately, that structural engineer went to the lift and hit the down button. And the businessman was getting a little bit worried. He said, the problem's on the 43rd floor. Why are you going hitting the down button? And the engineer said, you don't have a 43rd floor problem, you have a basement problem. And sure enough, down in the basement, they discovered that there was a janitor, a man that looked after the building, he actually lived there. He had a little uh, home there, a little flat, but he wanted to make a new room for himself. And so every week for months and months he'd been taking a brick from the wall of the basement of the building to make more room. And the basement problem became the 43rd floor problem. Because when you remove the fundamental building blocks from the foundation, the whole structure begins to crumble eventually. And in the same way, if we get our understanding of God wrong, inventing him in such a way that he suits our tastes and our preferences, we'll find that the entire structure of our Christian life and the whole structure of biblical truth will begin to show cracks and it will distort and, and, and warp our Christian living sometimes in dangerous ways take us down dangerous paths uh, and so as we think more about this commandment we might ask the question what about religious artwork you know the Sistine Chapel and uh, all the beautiful paintings and Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Is it wrong to have crosses? Is it wrong to have pictures of Jesus? What do you think? I think he's already for a cross. Or huh? I think he's already for a cross. It's just a remembrance of 
when Jesus went through it. Okay. Yeah. But it wouldn't have a cross with a figure on it. Crucifix. Yeah. yeah. It wouldn't have yeah. a figure on it. Right. Well, I think the key words in this commandment, um, well, the key word is idols. And the phrase, you shall not bow down and worship them. There's nothing wrong with religious symbols or artwork just by themselves. You know, people will wear a cross. People will have a little fish symbol that they'll wear. Maybe you're on their sticker on their car or something. Uh, you know, uh, a picture of the Last Supper, stuff like that. Um, the, uh, you know, I don't know if you watched The Passion of the Christ, that movie about the, the uh, uh, Easter weekend and, and all of that, and what that represented. There's nothing wrong with those sort of things in themselves. I mean, after all, you think about the tabernacle, you think about the, the, the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, they were full of religious artwork that God had instructed. And so the problem only happens when the symbol becomes a substitute and we worship the symbol, right? And, and I think human nature is prone to that mistake uh, of substituting the symbol for God. For example, when <laughs> you remember when God commanded Moses to make a bronze serpent in the wilderness. And while there was nothing wrong with the bronze serpent itself, it, it was functional, served a purpose. But later on, if you read later on, the people of Israel began to worship it as an idol. God had intended as a reminder of God's power over the serpents and a, a prefiguring of Christ on the cross when he was lifted up and so on. But the people corrupted it and made it into an idol. And unfortunately the same thing has happened sometimes with crosses and crucifixes throughout Christian history. And when people, you know, and I, I say this advisedly but, but, but humbly at the same time, and sincerely, when people bow down and pray to a crucifix or an image of Mary or a statue of a saint, they're breaking the second commandment, which forbids using those things as an object of worship. And you feel like saying, what part of the second commandment don't you understand? But if they haven't heard it. But then they haven't, they haven't been brought up with it. They haven't been taught it. Um... Um, but the importance of you know, the way in which we worship which this commandment is all about um, first commandment is about who we worship second commandment is about how we worship as much as who we worship uh, we can see that in the, in the other verses 5 and 6 we're told, we're told for example that God is a jealous God uh, a description of God and what we normally think of as a sinful human emotion uh, you know, we're, we're told not that jealousy isn't a good thing. Um, but we saw from the first commandment, and even in this one, that God demands total loyalty and devotion from his people. And ultimately, you know, ultimately the people of Israel provoke God to jealousy again and again by their idolatry. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 16 and 17, they made him jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. They sacrificed to demons which are not God. Gods they had not known. Gods that recently, recently appeared. Gods your fathers did not fear. Almost the entire history of, of, of the people of Israel, the, 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 the history of Israel in the Old Testament, is a history of their struggle between worshipping God properly and worshipping God by means of idols and other things. And so, you know, we might say to ourselves, well, but isn't, you know, he's a jealous God, but isn't jealousy wrong? Because the Bible teaches us that jealousy is wrong. And it can be wrong, but jealousy isn't always wrong. Jealousy to us is, is a negative emotion. But God's jealousy is different. One commentator explains it like this, and I've printed it in your notes that you'll get. He said this, divine jealousy is not the insecure, insane, possessive human jealousy that we often interpret this word to mean. Rather, he says, it is an intensely caring devotion to the object of his love. 
God has a holy jealousy. You might even say a zeal, to use a biblical word, a zeal for what's right. And the Bible even says, but the Bible even says that, I don't know if you knew this, that one of God's names is jealous. Exodus 34, verse 14. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Exodus 34, 14. See, idolatry is compared to spiritual adultery. Ezekiel says that in chapter 23, verse 37, they have committed adultery with their idols. So yes, God is jealous, but it's the righteous jealousy, for example, of a husband for his spouse who's not going to stand idly by and let his spouse be unfaithful to him. It's that sort of jealousy. And, and God takes it seriously. Remember, remember what he did to Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10 when they offered a sacrifice that he had not asked for? Uh, they went into the temple and they were trying to offer, offer something to God that God hadn't asked them to do. What did he do? Killed him on the spot. Or in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, when the children of Israel put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart, do you remember that? And they were car carrying it back to Jerusalem. And when the oxen, the old oxen stumbled, do you remember? Uzzah reached out to steady the ark. Do you think that was a good thing to do? To keep it from falling? What happened to him? He struck down dead. You may think, well, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty nasty. But if you go back and read Samuel's chapter 6 and 7, the ark was not supposed to be carried on a cart in the first place. It was supposed to be carried on poles. So people weren't doing things God's way as God had prescribed it. And God takes that seriously. God takes his worship seriously, even down to the details. God's saying, when, you know, when God says, I'm a jealous God, he's reminding us of his covenant and the covenant that we have with him as his children. And he's saying that when you choose to do what you want to do instead of doing what I said that you should do in my word, particularly about worshipping me, it's like you've gone off and committed adultery. And I'm the wrong husband. That's basically what God is saying about being a jealous God. Suppose for a minute a woman walks into a room and finds her husband embracing another woman. And he sees his wife out of the corner of his eye while he's doing that. She's just come into the room and he says, Now wait a minute. Hang on now, let me explain. Don't get the wrong idea. This woman is so beautiful, she reminded me of you. And I was really just thinking of you when I was embracing her. <laughs> I can tell you, there's not a woman in Ireland <laughs> who would buy that, including my wife. Right? <laughs> and God, God doesn't buy it either when we worship something else or in a way that he hasn't uh, said we should. Uh, you know, we can't say, no, Lord, hang on a minute. Now, don't get the wrong idea here. I, I was only worshipping this thing and in this way because it reminds me of you. God's not going to buy that because he knows our hearts. But then, as we bring this to a conclusion tonight, he goes on to give a very stiff warning. He says, I, I visit the iniquities of the fathers, the sins of the fathers, and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. And, and when you read that, you start to think, well, that doesn't sound fair. First generation, generation one sins, and he punishes people four generations on from that for the sins of the fathers, for the grandfathers, the great grandfathers. What's, what's that all about? And, and, and notice, you know, uh, hate here, he says, the fourth generation of those who hate me. Hate, in, in that context, is simply an alternative word for disobeying. <clears throat> disobeying God. Disobeying this command. And, and it's, it's, it's a sign of God's strict justice. He won't look the other way when we worship an image of God rather than God himself. But then notice 
as well, when he goes on to say, he gives a word of promise and a word of compassion and mercy and blessing. He says, but showing loving kindness to thousands who love me and keep my commands. And remember, remember what Jesus said himself on the night on which he was betrayed. He said, if you love me, keep my commands. To love God is to keep his commands. So what God is saying is that the way we worship is a reflection of our knowledge of God and it's a reflection of how seriously we take him. That's quite a sobering thought when it comes to Sunday and worship. Our mouths might be singing songs but where's our hearts in relation to our worship towards God? And if we know his nature, who God is, and we know his warning, and we know his promises, we should be careful to worship him in accordance with his word. So we must worship God for who he is, and according to his <coughs> attributes, his characteristics, we worship him for his holiness, his love, his mercy, his grace, his power. And we must worship him according to his commands, and that should include prayer, thanksgiving, fasting, singing hymns and praises, reading his word, preaching, sharing his word, observing baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, we've talked about the Lord's Supper. We'll talk about baptism. This Sunday we're going to talk about membership. And, and worshipping God includes all of these things, fellowship and membership of his church and practicing appropriate church government and discipline, whatever else God has commanded command us to, to be and to do in his word. And then finally we have to worship God through Christ. If you want a true image of God, Colossians 1 and 15 says of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God. And Hebrews 1 and verse 3 says, he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So we have to worship God through Christ. And, of course, Jesus himself said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Father. And so, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul says that what can be known about God is plain to us because he has shown it to us for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature having been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. And so, he says, as far as knowing who God is, all that can be known about God, and so, he says, we are without excuse. We don't have to imagine. We don't have to create. <coughs> He's shown us in his word. And then he adds, Apostle Paul adds in Romans 1, although we knew God, we did not honour him as God or give thanks to him. But we became futile in our thinking and our foolish minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, we became foolish and we exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, representing mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So there you have it. Um, there's always that temptation. And as I said, most people today, I'm sure including people in this room, all of us, <coughs> We haven't made any graven images or carved out any images. But Martin Luther said, he said it well, said, anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say, that is really your God. You can have idols in your heart without making them with your hands. And in our modern culture, we've made gods of ourselves. And Paul warned us of that of men who would be lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. And so, to wrap it all up, and I have one question to ask you as I finish. Our worship of God is to be spiritual and internal, not external and visual. It's to be in truth, regulated and limited by the commands of Scripture, um, not the inventions of our own imaginations or minds or the dictates of our own preferences. Uh, because, you know, we don't think we know better than the Word of God, but there's no, there's no room 
for, for novelty when it comes to the doctrine of who God is. We don't make God. We need to remind ourselves that he made us. He created us. And why? To worship him. We didn't invent him. He reveals himself to us. And we don't imagine him in what way best suits us. We, we bow in holy awe. And we conform ourselves to his sovereign will. And the final thing I would say, and maybe the most important thing that we could say about this second commandment, is this. Idolatry, in whatever shape or form it comes, in actual physical reality or in our minds, having some idols in our minds, idolatry, listen, is the greatest sin. Why? Because it breaks the greatest commandment. To love God with our heart, our soul, and our mind. Jesus said it in Matthew 22. You should love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And idolatry of any kind breaks that commandment. Let me just ask this question. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll leave the study there uh, for now.